you have your Bibles, please take your copy of God's Word and open up to 1 Corinthians. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to this time right now, where we open up the Word of God, we believe that this Word is inspired. We believe it's authoritative. It has bearing over our lives. And so, Lord, as we, as we come now, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what you're saying, give us eyes to hear what, you're, what it is you're trying to reveal to us. Give us hearts to receive it today. Convict our hearts encourage and strengthen our hearts in the ways that we just need you to work. We need you to move. We ask that you would come and work in a surprising way. I pray for our, for our kids who are going up for kids' worship. I pray the same thing for them as they're hearing the message preached to them and shared with them. Uh, I pray that you would be with them and help them to respond to the gospel the same way that we saw evidenced in Miss Kinsley and Miss Joni, and that we would have more and more people who come through these doors, that you minister to them, you, work, you, you convict them of their sins and bring them to a saving faith in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray all these things in his holy and precious name. Amen. We are continuing our series, Letters from the Early Church. But we're kind of making a shift this morning from Peter to Paul, and my sermon title this morning is A Spectacle of Suffering. I'm just going to begin by reading 1 Corinthians 4, 9, where Paul says, For I think God displays us apostles as last, and condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the whole world, to angels and to men. And we'll come back to that verse, but I just want to kind of begin with that verse in our mind. I want to talk about motives for just a moment, because motives matter. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning, and what motivates you really matter. But what is a, mo a motive? What motivates you? A motive is it's a, it's a, it's this impulse, or it's an influence on your life that pushes you to action. That's what a motive is. It can be a need or a want that forces you then to take actions to get to that need or that want that you have. And what we can do is we can examine, we can examine people's actions and kind of get back to, oh, well, their motive must be this. Because we all have something that motivates us. Every single one of us has got something that's motivating us. So when I played basketball, I played basketball back in high school, there was something that motivated me because who really, like, kind of in their right mind wants to, you know, we had to go to practice and it took two hours a day. And then we would lift weights and that took additional time each day. And so during the season of basketball, there was a lot of time devoted to practicing lifting weights and it was painful at times. And you had to endure sometimes coaches not happy with your behavior. And so, but why? Why would we do that? Why would we go through that? There was something that motivated us, and we wanted to win, right? You want to win. Well, I, I, we wanted to win, but we also wanted to, I, I like just being part of the team. I love being there with the guys and the fellowship that came along with it. I love the, I wanted to get better, right? So that, that motivated me to go to practice. And we all have motives. Some of them are really positive motives, like integrity and honesty, Right? We all live with your family. you got family, and so you either want to be a good child, you want to be a good son, you want to be a good daughter, or you want to be a good mom and dad, you're, and you're motivated by excellence and integrity. You want to be the best that you can be. If you work, you want to be the best employee that you can be. If you're a boss, you want to, you just, you're motivated by excellence. Hopefully, those can be really positive motivators. There's also negative things that motivate us, things like anger, and fear, those can motivate us into action. Things 
And, you know, even like I, I put down here money and success, right? Those things, are, they're not necessarily bad, but they can become bad really quick, right? Or you're motivated by success and you're just going to, you're going to walk over anybody just to get the success that you want or the money. You just, you want money. You just, you just want to make more money to buy more things. And that can be bad as well. Or maybe your motivation is just to get through the week so you can get to the weekend. And so that's a pretty weak motivation in life, just to get to the weekend. Because a lot of times that's coupled with, I just want to get to the weekend so I can lose myself and um, medicate myself with substances. And that's not the right motivation either. And what I want to talk about today is what motivated Paul. I'm always fascinated by Paul. And as we're switching from Peter to Paul, I want to try to ask this question, what motivated this man, Paul? This man who was probably born around the same time that Jesus was born. And then in the year 34, after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this man became a Christian. And in the year 66, 67, he was executed for being a Christian. We know that he was a Jew. We know that he was a Pharisee. We know that he was persecuting Christians. And then something happened and he became a missionary for the church that he was persecuting. He became a missionary. And then as you read, though, about his missionary journeys and his missionary efforts, what happens is he encounters a lot of mm, headwind. And it Frequently, this man is beaten for his faith. And if you read through Acts, like multiple times, they left him for dead. He was beaten to the point where everybody was like, that guy's dead, let's go home. Beaten, frequently beaten, frequently imprisoned. And then frequently misunderstood by his churches. He'd go to these towns, he would plant churches. And they would respond to the gospel, and then he would leave, and they would misunderstand what he was saying, and then there would be problems, and then he would write letters, and that's what we're looking at today. But what motivates this man to be frequently beaten for this message, this gospel that he preaches? What motivates him to go to prison for it? And what motivates him to keep going in and keep trying to help these churches? Right? Don't you want to know? Like, why would you? What motivates him to keep going when all hope seems lost? What motivates him? Well, Paul reveals, I think, what we would call the proper and the primary motive for life, and it is the simple gospel of a crucified Messiah. That's what motivated him. And it's a simple message that he believed and he clinged on to with all of his heart, but it's what motivated him through all of those things. And so as we turn, and it really what, where we're heading, we're, next week we will start First Thessalonians, but I wanted to try to, I'm just trying to get at Paul a little bit today. And there's no way in this one sermon we can get at kind of all that is Paul and what really motivates him. We're just going to kind of look at one aspect of of Paul, what motivates him. And then next week we'll turn to his letter to the first, uh, to the Thessalonians. But today we're looking at 1 Corinthians just to try to get into his mind a little bit. And so 1 Corinthians, a little bit of background here is Paul, during his second missionary journey, he spent over a year and a half with the Corinthians. It's quite a long time for him to spend there, and he took his law-free gospel. All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, and you'll be saved. He'll fill you up with with his spirit, and you'll know what to do. And so they embraced his law-free gospel there in Corinth. They responded to the gospel, but they they reasoned that, oh, his law-free gospel means that we can do whatever we want. We just continue to sin. And what happened is they began to kind of pervert his, uh, his gospel, and it became kind of a promiscuous perver- perversion of the gospel. And we're not going to get into all that this morning, but they took his law-free gospel, and it turned into this promiscuous perversion of it. And it led to the greater problem in Corinth of, you have now in this church in Corinth, um, division and immorality. Division in the church and immorality in the church. And so he leaves. And then on his third mission trip, he's in Ephesus. 
And he's wanting to, he hears about what's going on in Corinth. They've responded to it, right? He's, he's, he's preached the gospel. They've responded to it. But now there's this immorality and there's division rising up in this church. And in, from Ephesus, he says, I need, to, I need to write a letter. I need to write a letter to this church. And, so it, and I like this, this, uh, this passage because this is kind of a high-pressure situation for Paul. All right, the, the stakes are kind of high. And what we see here is we're going to see what, what comes out of Paul when he's squeezed, when he comes under pressure, when he gets under stress, what comes out of him, All right? Because I think if, you, if we really get down to, that, that's, that's the motive, right? We're going to see what's really inside of him, what really motivates him when you get stress that's going to come out. And this is, this is what always happens with Paul. This is one thing we need to know about Paul is that we get a lot of his good theology. One of the reasons why we love Paul is because he's all about theology, but usually we get his good theology because he's addressing something negative going on in the church. Something negative happens in the church. There's, for Corinth, there's immorality, there's division, and so he's writing to address those things, which then he has to bring in his good theology, but there's always that occasion. There's always that, there's always something going on, something negative going on where he has to kind of address it, and so again, that's when we we can squeeze out from Paul kind of his motives and his theology. So in in Corinth, we have what I'll call the Corinthian misunderstanding. And it it shows itself in at least two ways, where the Corinthians, they favored impressive speeches. They were cultured people, and they favored really impressive speakers. Remember, there's no, there's no internet, there's no TV, no entertainment like that. And so to really uh, make something of yourself, you had to go into the public square in a public sitting, and you had to be able to deliver a speech really well to make your case known to the public, because there's no TV, there's no news channels. And so you have philosophers of the day who they would go and do that, and what mattered was it was more about how you said the things how you made your case versus what you were saying, All right? So how you said it, how well you said it was more important than the content itself. And they valued that. And in their opinion, Paul is a weak speaker. He shows up and he can't compete with the philosophers in his speech. He's a poor speaker. Well, they also favored worldly pleasure. Why? Well, they reasoned, and the philosophers reasoned, that God gave us these pleasures. God gave these pleasures to us, and so we should enjoy them. Gods have given them to us, so we should enjoy worldly pleasures. And just in Corinth, all you, all you have to do is start reading further ahead, and you start realizing that the pleasure that is kind of the problem in Corinth is sexual pleasure. And so they're... they're they reason that if it feels good, then you should do it. Does it sound familiar to any other culture? <laughs> if it feels good, just do it. And so in their mind, suffering and self-sacrifice, does that feel good? No. And so for them, Paul lived a cursed life. It's cursed of God. Everywhere that guy goes, what happens? He's beaten up. He's thrown in prison. Sometimes he has to turn tail and just run out of the city at night. Right? And they'd had, they've had other philosophers do a similar thing. They come into town and preach their philosophy and take money from the people. And what do those philosophers do? They leave at night, get out of there. And so they're, they're evaluating Paul and all of his behaviors, and they say, he's... He's a fool. This man, Paul, is a fool. He's cursed of God. He lives this life cursed of God. He abstains from pleasure. And look at how he suffers. And therefore, for the Corinthians, Paul is less credible because he suffered so much. All right? Do you see how they're thinking? He's less credible because he's suffering so much. Paul, that... That guy, he is just motivated by foolishness. And what they conclude is we should not imitate him.
So 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 8. Here's Paul when he's squeezed. And part of the, the, the dilemma going on in Corinth is there's a, the division is over. There are some people in Corinth saying, well, hey, you know, since Paul has all these question marks around him, we're of Apollos. We're of this other apostle, Apollos. Um, and then there's this other group that says they're of Paul. And so this is what he's addressing here in, in 1 Corinthians 1 through, for, or chapter 4, 1 through 8. So look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ who have been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. Now, a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or any human authority. All right, do you hear it? All right, they've, they've obviously tipped their hand away from Paul, and he's saying, I, well, it matters little how you evaluate me. I don't even trust my own judgment at this point. My conscience is clear. But that doesn't prove I'm right. It's the Lord himself will, who will examine and decide. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time. Before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets, our motives to light, and he will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. Dear brothers and sisters, I've used Apollos and myself to illustrate what I've been saying. If you pay attention to what I've quoted from scriptures, you won't be proud of one of your leaders at the expense of another. All right, because that just causes division. For what gives you the right to make such a judgment? Why do you have, what, what do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? You think you already have everything you need. You think, you, you think you're already rich. You've begun to reign in God's kingdom without us. I wish you really were reigning already, for then we would be reigning with you. And here's the verse. Instead, I sometimes think that God has put us apostles on display. Like prisoners of war at the end of a victor's parade, condemned to die, we have become a spectacle to the entire world, to people and to angels alike. In verse 9, he says, I think, All right, and that, that, when he says, I think, we're, we're getting at some of Paul's motive here. We're getting at kind of what makes him tick. He says, I think, we're getting a glimpse into his mind here, and he says, I thank God. And what we're seeing here in this verse, in verse 9, is we're getting inside of Paul's mind, and he's giving us this theological thought that he has this is a thought he has about God and what God is doing in his life. And what he says is, I think that God has put us apostles on display. Like a trophy. Right? Or, you know, if, if there's something that you want to remember, what, you know, those shadow boxes, is that, is that what they're called? You hang, you hang those up in your office or you hang them up in your living room because you want to put on display something that makes you proud. And so he's put us on display, this public recognition of us. And he says, as condemned to death, though, he's, God, he, I think, Paul, here's Paul thinking, I think God has put us on display as condemned to death. And what Paul is talking about here is when an emperor would go out and would have this great victory and would defeat another people, what would happen is the emperor would come back into town, and he would lead the way. His generals would come next, the mighty army afterwards, and then last of all, the last would be the slaves, the people that they conquered, all chained up. And a lot of times what would happen is these people would be ushered then into the arena. And so what Paul's saying is, that's us. I feel like that's what us apostles are, right there at the last, all chained up. God's just putting us on display to suffer and to die. And he says even this, it's a spec as a spectacle, we're just a spectacle of suffering. It's a theater term. God's just putting us out there like this is a big show. He wants everybody to see the spectacle of suffering that we are. And who's watching? 
Well, those in heaven and on earth are all watching the spectacle that God wants to put on display. Doesn't Paul think in a fascinating way? Do your thoughts line up with his thoughts? Let's move on here. Let's look at verse 10 through the rest of the chapter. I'm just going to read it. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like what? Fools. All right, we're just back here at the back of the line, all chained up. You think you've already arrived, Corinthians, but we're back here. I wish we've already arrived and we could be celebrating with you, but we're back here. We're the last. Our dedication to Christ, so the last, our dedication to being the last to suffering, he says, see, you've got it wrong. This is our dedication to Christ. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools, but you claim to be so wise in Christ. We're weak, but you're so powerful. You are, you are honored, but we are ridiculed. Even now, we go hungry and thirsty, and we don't even have enough clothes to keep warm. We're often beaten and have no home. We work wearily with our hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal, appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Yet we are treated like the world's garbage. Like everybody's trash. Right up to the present moment. And you think he's talking about even them, the Corinthians? Even right now, Corinthians, you're treating me like trash. But don't worry, I think God's put me in that position to be on display. You ever been treated like trash? Anybody? I'm not writing these things to shame you. Here's where his pastoral tone comes out. I'm not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the gospel to you, the good news to you. So I urge you to what? Imitate me. You found me unimitatable but I declare I am imitatable. That's, what I, that's why I've sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the, Lord, in the Lord. He will remind you of how I followed Christ Jesus just as I teach in all the churches everywhere I go, wherever I go. Some of you have become arrogant, thinking I wish not to visit you again, but I will come, and soon, if the Lord lets me, and I'll find out whether these arrogant people just, have, just give pretentious speeches or whether they really have God's power. So that's what really matters, is God's power. For the kingdom of God is not just in a lot of talk. And it's not just how you say it. It's what's being said. It's the content of your life. Anyone can talk the talk, but are you walking the walk? Can you put your life where your mouth is? Like Paul is what he's getting at. For the kingdom of God is not just in a lot of talk, it's by living by God's power. Which do you choose? Should I come with a rod of punishment for you or should I come with love and a gentle spirit? See the pastoral fatherly tone? You choose, children. What would you prefer? So Paul acts like a spectacle of suffering for the church. He wants to preach the gospel of foolishness to the cro- of the cross He's going to preach, he's going to speak with weak words, but with the power of God, he doesn't mind if he's going to come in weak words because what, for him, what matters is it's the very power of God. So he's going to be a spectacle, he's going to preach this foolish gospel. He's going to, he doesn't care if he's going to sound weak, he's still going to preach in the power of God. He even said at the beginning of 1 Corinthians I, I, that I'd, I would forget everything but Christ and him crucified. I wish I could forget everything, I just want you to hear Christ and him crucified this foolish message of Christ and him crucified. And so he's acting like this spectacle. He's in, and he's, he is willing as a spectacle of suffering to give his life for the gospel. And Paul's point is, I know you think you shouldn't imitate me, but imitate me. He's defending his apostleship because the gospel is at stake here. 
They're imitating a, kind of what he would, I think he would call it kind of a, ch- a cheap version of the gospel, kind of an easy, cheesy version of the gospel that they bought into. It's all about other things besides suffering, anything but suffering. And when squeezed, when Paul actually has to kind of come out and make a case here for why they should follow him, what comes out? The cross. And this is what fascinates me about Paul. Because I think if I'm honest, when I get squeezed, when you get squeezed, when we get squeezed, what comes out typically? Anger, revenge, fear. These things can come out, can't they? But for Paul, what comes out is the cross. But what motivated Paul? What motivated Paul to be a spectacle of suffering? And I think for Paul, what's motivating Paul is the unity and the holiness of the church. I think he wants to see this church, one church, unified underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ. See, Paul's aim, what he's trying to do, he's trying to put himself forward as a spectacle of suffering for the Corinthians. And for Paul, wisdom begins at the cross. All right, for the Corinthians, they said this is foolish, but for Paul, it, where does wisdom, where are we going to start when we talk about wisdom? For Paul, it begins at the cross. Wisdom begins at the cross, and so he just embraces that foolishness. I know it sounds foolish, but that's where the wisdom of God begins, is right there at the cross. And therefore, Number one, self-sacrifice becomes a primary example. If that is the wisdom of God, if that's how God worked in his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, is through a self-sacrificing man, if that is the example, it is our example. If wisdom is found at the cross, then that becomes our example. Self-sacrifice becomes the primary example. And two, pursuing what I want and what feels good. If that, right, take that philosophy what, that worldly philosophy, just do what feels good and then bring it to the cross and tell me how it lines up. It doesn't. You don't see that at the cross. At the cross, you see a suffering servant who self-sacrificed for you, gave up everything for us. And I think what Paul's saying is that for the Corinthians, their only hope is to become fools for the gospel. Come, become fools like Christ, become fools like Paul. That's, how are they going to get the holiness that he desires? How, is he, how are they going to get that unity that he desires for Paul? Become a fool for the gospel, the simple gospel of a crucified Messiah. Become a fool with me. Now, these questions that the Corinthians faced, I just don't, I don't think they were unique to them. And I can see you guys already nodding along with me when I was telling you about the Corinthian questions. They're the same things that we deal with today, right? So the wisdom of the world today, it's out there, right? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, whatever else. The wisdom of the world is out there. And what the wisdom of the world is telling us is, hey, if you can just produce a, a, a really, um, a, will, a well put together video, you know, that's been edited and everything looks really good and it's funny, then our world just thinks, oh, that's truth. If you can edit good videos, and, and, right, how you say it, if you can produce a really good video and make it look really good and make it look really flashy, then it can, are we just, oh, that's the wisdom of the world. The content may be horrible, but man, it's so well put together. You can make, and you can cut and edit a video, make it sound and look great, but the content is empty. And we have, so we have these influencers, I think that's what we call them, right? They're on Instagram and they're on Facebook. If you have a big platform, you become an influencer. 
you are an influencer, you have a platform, and you get to share your opinions, and people are going to listen to it. And really what we're doing is we're just listening to what we believe to be kind of the funniest and the best videos, and who cares about the content, right? Does that sound familiar to the world that we live in? So this wisdom of the world, I think, is still the same thing, and I think the pleasures of the world are still a question for us today. I don't know if the influencers that are out there on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and the rest, whatever, I don't know if the message has changed a whole lot from if it feels good, then do it. And if that's what the Corinthian philosophers are saying, if it feels good, just do it, go for it. I'm pretty sure we're just there, we just turned up the knob. If it feels good, do it, is what our world is saying, what those influencers are, are saying. And they're saying, you'd be a fool not to go with us, right? You'd be a fool not to kind of buy into everything the world is throwing at, at you. And of course, America's confusion over sexuality is kind of, it's obviously a, a point of emphasis here. And honestly, I think when you read through Corinthians, I'm not sure we've made a whole lot of progress. But Paul's point is still the same. The world looks at anyone who abstains from those pleasures and says, hey, I don't know, actually, I'm not sure I buy into this philosophy that just do what feels good. I, I ascribe to a different philosophy. If you, if you start backing off of that, what's the world begin to call you? Fool. And what is Paul saying? Then let's all be fools for Christ. If that's what they're going to call us, then let's be fools for Christ. So what do you say? You want to be a fool for Christ with me? I say we do it. And I think that's the question, right? Is Paul going to be our apostle? Are we kind of getting at what motivates him, what propels him, but the question for the church in Corinth is, are we going to trust Paul? Is he going to be our apostle or not? Is the question for us today as well. Is he going to become, or are we going to let him come in and be our apostle? And start messing with and monkeying with the, the wisdom of the world that we ascribe to and to the pleasures of the world that we ascribe to. Are we going to let him come in and say, no, 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 let's line that up with the cross. Anything, does that match up? Let's, yeah. When you're squeezed, what comes out? If Paul is your apostle, when you're squeezed, what's going to come out is the simple message of the gospel of a crucified Messiah. If Paul is your apostle, what happens when you're squeezed is you're just going to say, okay, well, then I'll self-sacrifice. I'll give up what I want for the sake of other people. And again, just think, if, that's, if, that, if everybody is kind of operating like Paul sets out here, I, I think it'd be a unified church. I think it'd be a church that said no to immorality and said, no, let's be holy. Let's be holy. For Paul, there's one Lord, one crucified Lord, who has one people. And this is why it's so important that he is the one true God. If there's one true God, he should have one people, undivided for Paul. And if he's a one crucified Lord over all of his people. And what's that say about us? We are all the crucified people. And this is what Paul says in another letter. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but he who lives in me. And he talks about how I've been crucified to this world. All my desires and everything that I thought was like really valuable in this world, I've, I've been crucified to that, and I am now living a whole new life in Christ. So if there's one crucified Lord, he should have one crucified people. And do you see why sometimes when he, when he sees and hears about divisions in his church, he's like, no, 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 no. Because there's one Lord, and he should have one people with no divisions in there whatsoever. And the way that we maintain that, and the way that Paul puts himself forward and says, okay, okay, we got a problem here. How are we going to fix it? We have got to 
take upon us this crucified life. I wanted this, but for the sake of everyone, I'll give it up and live this self-sacrificial life, which looks like foolishness to the Corinthians. One final question as the, uh, as the band comes back up here. We're going to sing a song of, uh, 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 we're going to sing another worship song. And it is an invitation song, but I just have one more question for us as we're thinking through this sermon. What, if we dr- just drill one more step deeper, what motivated Paul what? Okay, so he wants the church to be unified. He doesn't want to see any division, and he sees himself to, be, to become the spectacle. What motivated him to do this? And of course, the answer, this is the Sunday school answer, who, who motivated him to do this? It was Jesus. Paul was a Jew, and he was converted on the road. He was knocked off his horse. And he came face to face with Jesus Christ, the one, the one. So what motivated him? A man. It was a man. His name is Jesus Christ. And he was the most beautiful man that ever lived. He lived a beautiful life, sinless life. He didn't do anything wrong. And Paul came face to face with this man. He encountered Jesus. And this is such a spectacular thing. We, we, it has a special name. Scholars call this a Christophany. When Paul, he, his motive, what? I'm going to go kill those Christians. That's his motive. That'll, that'll be good. And on the road, he encounters someone, a man, a perfect man, the highest man. Jesus Christ, and everything changes. He goes from a motive to kill Christians to saying, I want to be a Christian. I've encountered not a, not a theology, not just like a, it, it, it was him. He encountered Jesus. It was Jesus who interacted with him. It was Jesus who met with him and changed his life. And that's my question for you. Have you met Jesus? Not all this, I love church, I love religion, I love all of this stuff that we're doing, but the question, the question that Paul keeps coming back to is just the simple gospel of a crucified Messiah. And what Paul would say is, all you have to do is believe in him and you will be saved. Wait, that sounds foolish. Think about all the sin in my life. You just tell me he's going to come in and wipe all that away? Yeah, I know it sounds foolish, but we call it grace. We call it mercy. And it's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. And it, you can't make it make sense. But I'm telling you what Paul has told you. If you just believe this good news, you believe this gospel, that there is a crucified Messiah and he died on the cross for your sins, Paul says you will be saved in that very moment you believe. Doesn't that sound good? Have your sins washed away? Just gone? And my question is, have you encountered him? Have you had that moment? I know it, it's maybe not going to be as dramatic as Paul's moment where he was knocked off his horse and he, he couldn't even see for a while. But have you met Jesus? I'm not asking if you come to church and if you do religious things. I'm asking, have you met him? If you haven't, you're missing out. He's wonderful. He's perfect. He's the highest. He's given everything for you. Everything. He gave his life for you. And what he says is, come, come to me, come to me. Bend your knee before me. Give me your life and he will restore us and give you life. Why don't you bow your heads, close your eyes. If today 
you would say, I know I haven't had that moment. I haven't had that time where I met Jesus. But I want to. He sounds wonderful. He can wash away my sins, and yes, I want to believe in him. And it's just that simple? Yes, it is just that simple. It's that simple. And I know the churches have probably made it harder sometimes than others, and, but it is just that simple. And that's what I'm putting before you today. If that's you today and you say, yes, I want to believe, all you have to do is say a prayer in your heart that goes something like this. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I admit to you that I'm a sinner. I admit to you, I, 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 I just bring to you all the sin. I can't get rid of it. It's just such a heavy weight, heavy burden, and it gets all over me, and I can't, I'm so filthy. I can't get it off of me. There's nothing I can do to get out of this brokenness, but I believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on a cross, and this message of this man can save me, and I believe it. And since you're a king, I commit the rest of my life to follow you. And I'm telling you, if you said that prayer and meant it in your heart, even just now, then you are saved. You, all you have to do is believe in that simple gospel of a crucified Messiah dying on a cross for your sins. Lord, for the rest of us who have believed, Paul didn't just believe in Jesus' cross for his salvation. Paul seemed to believe that this is the answer to everything. Any problem, any, any sickness, any division, any immorality, any problem that we have for Paul, the answer is Christ on a cross. Help us to think like him. And where we don't, correct us. Help us to walk around thinking like Paul, that Jesus and him crucified is the answer. And help us to live it out. Help us to imitate Paul as he imitates Christ.